Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap and a part two of a two-part emphasis on the seventh principle in our 10 Principles to National Renewal series. We use the word renewal because these 10 principles were once identified, they were embraced, and they were intentionally built into the fabric of our American law and justice system. They were also taken from the pages of Scripture and carefully considered by such founders as William Penn and many others. And these principles are found throughout the Declaration of Independence, various state and U.S. constitutions, and found engraved, literally engraved on state and federal government buildings. They also used to be taught from the pulpits of America, but for a generation or more, generally rejected, ignored, certainly redefined. And our purpose for presenting this series is to help present the roadmap back to renewal as the only way to recover God's blessings on our nation and to stem the slide into bondage. And with that, I welcome you to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'll be joined in just a moment by Pastor Isaac Crockett. The entire approach to understanding government, law, justice, God's framework to enact justice by punishing those who do evil and protecting and praising those who do well, all of these things hinge on one's world view. Only a biblical worldview, though, yields a concept of unchanging truth, true, observable justice based on just law with all those in positions of authority, including all individuals operating under authority in the capacity of servants of God, all carrying out the purposes of God. What I describe there is God's plan, but only a biblical worldview, which starts with the principles of integrity, then moves to God as sovereign creator and judge and redeemer, and then the concept of sin and mankind as depraved and sinful from birth. Then the concept that God, though, so loved the world that He sent Jesus Christ to redeem mankind. Only this biblical worldview can produce then just law and freedom and justice for all. Every and all other worldviews, be they atheistic, communist, Islamic, or demonic globalism, all of those reject Jesus Christ as King, and all of those produce tyranny and bondage and unimaginable horror such as we're seeing unfold around our world today. In our modern culture, truth has been redefined. According to most people, truth is relative, not absolute. But we cannot survive as a nation of laws until truth is once again embraced as absolute. Even when truth is accepted as absolute, it must be administered with mercy or it becomes harsh and cold. So what is mercy? Well, mercy results from an understanding of grace with the goal of the individual's restoration. And while punishment for breaking the law must be enforced, there must be an element of mercy involved with restoration being the goal of punishment. Yet, just as justice administered based only on truth without mercy can become harsh, the administration of justice with mercy but without truth quickly becomes license. So the connection of the proper administration of justice from God's perspective cannot, however, be executed without a personal understanding of the grace of God as the author of truth, just and merciful, and as understood within the context of a biblical worldview and God's grand plan of redemption through Jesus Christ, His Son. It's a complete picture we're talking about. And Isaac, that is, in fact, what a biblical worldview it is. It's all of life taken from God's perspective and put together in a way, the only way where it all makes sense. Now, we're talking about justice. Last time and last week in the program, I gave the illustration of Lady Justice as sitting there reclining because she's not standing lording it over. She's reclining, holding a scale in her hands, truth and mercy on this scale, her eyes blindfolded to indicate administering justice equally to all. 
Well, I'm a father. I've mm. done that many times. <laughs> you know, I have, you know, six children, 14 grandchildren. You have children too. Just share something personal from your perspective, because every time you discipline your child, you are in the act of exercising justice. So how important is it that you cover your eyes, so to speak, when you administer justice? Yeah, you, yeah, you know, as a parent, as a father, how often that happens. My kids range from first grade to seventh grade. So um, a lot of that going on. And one of the things that I try to do is make it a teaching moment. And we talk about that a lot, but that's where kind of the rubber hits the road, so to speak, is to teach my kids what is right and wrong and what they've done, that they can look inward and see what they've done. And so allowing them to even to be able to solve the disputes within the, themselves at times, and other times having to bring it to the tribunal, you know, of dad, okay, you, you solve it. So I do try to ask them a lot of questions. What is the rule? Did you obey that? Did you break that? And, and go back to those basics and, and be consistent. And that consistency involves them, but it also even involves me with how I interact with them and that I ought myself uh, try to make sure I'm consistent in a consistent testimony and, and taking it always back to truth, to the Bible and that, that biblical worldview. And that's how I see it as a parent. Um, you know, I'm not perfect, but try to go back to the Word of God, and that doesn't change. So, uh, it's it's a big topic, and uh, yet, uh, so this is part two of this topic. So we've worked last time on defining justice. We want to look more at it today as we see this important role of justice in government. We're going to take a quick time out and be right back. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history, or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs. The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And as we look at this important topic of the role of justice in government and really the role of justice in any authority, uh, we want to now look at um, beyond just the definition of justice, but we want to actually look at kind of the practical workings of it, how it, how it works, how it fits together. And Sam, really to even discuss why God gave us this, you know, why, why there is justice, this ultimate goal. And so if we could just go to you right now to maybe um, talk through biblically this, you know, seventh principle that, that you have in the 10 principles of national renewal, this idea of justice. Biblically, how is justice enacted uh, in, in scripture? Well, <clears throat> in real life, we're going to talk more about that in, in later, but you gave an example of that when I asked you if, as, a, as a parent. Hmm. You're, you're actually enacting justice or injustice hmm. every time you interact with your child. And everybody watching the program right now, every one of them who are fathers and mothers or our children, which they all were at one point, we were all recipients of either justice or injustice or um, we administer justice or injustice. So the point you made, government should be thought of as, as authority. We've talked about that. And that means literally everybody, but we oftentimes think of those in government. Um, I, one of the best passages um, that I found that really demonstrates this is, is, is 1 Kings chapter 2. And uh, this is in a transition between King David who outside the Lord Jesus is the most, <laughs> most referenced person almost in the scripture. He was certainly the most referenced of all kings because Jesus came from the lineage of David, which is very interesting. We're not going to get into that. But, uh, but when David was passing off the throne to Solomon, he said this. He said, now Solomon, I'm, gonna, I'm about to die. I go the way of all the earth. Be strong. Show thyself a man and keep the charge of the Lord to walk in His ways. And that's what I talk about with the law. Keep His statutes, commandments, judgments, testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses. 
So here it is. Solomon's king. He's going to administer. He's going to be in this position. And the thing that David said is, be strong, be courageous, and keep the charge of the Lord. And the charge of the Lord there is the same word as a sentry or a gatekeeper. Every person in a position of authority is a gatekeeper to the communication of God's truth and the character of God. That is what's embodied in justice. And I won't go into all the details of it here, but then David tells Solomon, he said in verse 5, talks about Joab. Joab had committed a, a, a sin. I won't get into all of that. He shed blood. But David didn't actually execute justice. And then he said, so you do therefore, uh, Solomon, according to your wisdom, and don't let his head, his white hair, don't, don't let the fact that he's old bother you. Don't let him go down to the grave in peace. In other words, you've got some justice to administer to Joab, one of your first duties as a person in authority. But then he came right after that and said, But show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai the Gileonite, and let them eat at your table. And all that's demonstrating right there is that you're in a position of authority, you're a gatekeeper. Mm. What you are communicating are my commands and my laws. You are operating in the stead of God. Make sure that you do justice to those who have broken the law, but show kindness. Praise those who do well. Mercy mm -hmm. and truth. Back again exactly. Exhibited right here. So that, that's just a perfect one. It's probably the best one, Isaac, that I can, I can point to that we're, where it's, uh, that the two are just pulled again together. Truth and mercy executed by a, position, a person in a position of authority. Now, let's go back into this a little bit because um, uh, we've already talked about it, but expand upon it more here. Uh, the administration of justice, I ask you first, you gave an example as a father, okay? <laughs> Um, I went right here to the king. And uh, we know it happens in our society. We have a you know, judicial branch and executive branch and the legislative branch uh, and so forth. And many times we might think that justice is only something that somebody else does and it is only in perhaps in government, but it's much broader than that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just kind of expand upon that and just bring it down to the actual level. Is it possible that all of our listeners right now could actually be administrators of justice? Well, Sam, and I hope this doesn't shock you, but I actually learn a lot by listening to you and listening to this program. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to actually take in some of the things that you and some of our other co-hosts on radio have been teaching me. And so one of my uh, issues that I sometimes um, keeps me from understanding some of these principles is when I hear the word government, I think of politicians uh, or civil government, but sometimes I have some pretty bad thoughts about some of the government leaders uh, taking my tax money and things. But biblically, you've pointed this out before, there's different parts. Of it. There's self-government which is the individual and his responsibility to God. There's family government, mom and dad and the, the way they raise their children. There's church government, pastors and leaders, elders, deacons in the church. And then there's civil government. And all of these are given their authority from God. Hmm. And if we remember that, then that helps us understand that when we talk about justice in government, it really starts at the individual level. Um, and so when we look at that, then now we're looking at individuals, we're looking at equity, and truth and mercy. And so equity, am I treating others the way that I'm treating them, you know, or that I'm expected to? Am I expecting more from them than I am from myself? Am I treating others uh, with truth, the way God defines this? Is this, am I just changing things on them? Um, you know, unfortunately, too many times you hear parents say things to their children like, do as I say, not as I do. Well, that's not justice. That's not, you know, starting, making sure that you're self-governing yourself. Um, and then there's that mercy, being willing to ask for forgiveness, being willing to give forgiveness and praise others. So um, all of that, you know, works. And it really works into the next point, step eight, that we'll get into next week, too. But we, we all have that responsibility. This isn't just for the king or just for the president. Um, but the, the last point of significance, I wonder if you could just cover for us, what is God's purpose, his role mm. for giving us this, this idea of justice? Hmm. 
You know, Isaac, when you go to that, you go, you, you really can't answer that question without um, going to the heart of the source of truth, which is the bedrock of justice. <laughs> and I've already talked about it. Truth in the scripture is reflected in a number of different words, the law, the ordinances, the statutes, just what I read from 1 Kings 2 that David said to Solomon, keep all these things, keep the charge of the Lord. The charge of the Lord is the truth, it's the law, and it's a number of different ways, ordinances and precepts and testimonies and so forth that's referred to it. But then you put that together with the mercy. You, you communicate and you deal the punishment piece of the equation for those who break the law, who transgress the law. And then you show mercy to those who have understood their sin. And, um, and that brings us back to the whole concept we talk about, the, the, the plan of redemption. Mm -hmm. That comes out of the mind of God. God's, God made the world, sin came into the world, Adam and Eve defied God, they did their own thing, the devil is in there working, and now all men are born, we've covered these on further points, uh, on these ten principles, so now we're depraved from earth, there's no good within any of us. That's true. Um, but what does God say? God so loved the world. So if we respond to him, the transgression of a law, justice would say, we go to hell. Mm. We go to jail <laughs> mm -hmm. forever. But the love of God and his mercy said, no, I, I, I would like to offer redemption, a restoration in fellowship, um, a reconciliation between the estranged parties, God and man. And justice is the same way, so that when a judge or a parent deals with a child who has broken a command or a law, the goal should always be what God's goal is, and that is restoration. Apologize to your brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. If you stole something, you make it up. Restitution. Mm -hmm. You know, Isaac, it's interesting that when biblical justice is enacted properly, individuals are either punished, if they shed blood, the Old Testament policy was they lost their life because they shed blood. But in every other case, there was a process to restoration, a restitution, pay back what you stole, hmm. and then be restored. Father said so you can get back in the home with your family and start caring for them and back on the right track. Um, there were no prisons in Israel. It's interesting. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. right? Because they, they enacted biblical justice. Hmm. What do we have in our life? We, we have more prisons in America than any nation in the world. Hmm. It's an indication that we have not been practicing biblical justice for a long time, because the purpose of justice is to restore the individual back to society and to their family, but ultimately to lead them to God with a restoration of their life and their heart to the God of heaven, which then allows them to be restored to their neighbors and their friends. That is biblical justice, and that's the goal. And that's biblical justice. Real quickly here, what is the greatest threat hmm. to biblical justice being implemented in our culture today? You know, Isaac, I think um, other than the fact that we just have people who don't fear God, mm -hmm. the biggest threat we have people who say, I don't, I don't care who God is. Mm -hmm. And so that, that goes to the heart of it. But there is a practice in government. It's called money. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's called mm -hmm. bribery. Mm -hmm. Let me just read just a little bit from Deuteronomy. This, this is great. It says, it says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all of your towns, Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 20. Officers in all of your towns that the Lord God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. Here it goes. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. That's the piece right here. Get your covers back on your eyes. No partiality. And you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise. 
and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Then in Isaiah 22, 25 to 30, it, it, are the passage, that's where I just, there's passages in there. First uh, Samuel 8, 3 says this, uh, gave an example, Eli was a, prof, was a priest. Mm -hmm. It, but it says, Scripture said, His sons did not walk in His ways, but they turned aside after lucre, money. And they took bribes, and what happened? They perverted judgment. And then there are many, many other passages. Isaac, the taking of bribes, which is what has happened in American culture today. We are a culture of government, of corruption, and bribery. You can see it on every hand. And when, so people look around and they say, why is what we're seeing so apparently not justice? It's because we've been given to bribery, which perverts judgment. And when judgment is perverted, God is out of the picture. Restoration is never a goal. Reconciliation is never a goal. And you have a circumstance where God says, I'm going to judge you as a nation because you have thrown off my justice. When we come back in just a moment, we'll wrap up this program for today. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Sam, this whole topic, uh, part two now of this justice in government, and government all the way down to individual self-government, all the way up to civil leaders, civil government, it's been powerful, I think. It's been very practical for me. It's helped you know, me think through the, this whole situation. Um, but you know, when you lay all of these out, it just it makes sense, though, um, and it, because it's biblical. And so as you've been going through, you know, William Penn's writings and teachings and as you come up, came up with these 10 steps to national renewal, um, it's, you know, it's kind of like building a house. You have to have your architectural plans and things. You can't just shortcut things. Uh, all of these things build on each other and they work together to make it work. Um, what, what could you say to kind of wrap this part up and maybe uh, show us how it fits into what, where we've come and where, where we're going with this, these 10 steps? Um, Isaac, again, I think your, your example of a house, we've, we've talked about it. Our founders actually quoted the verse, except the Lord build the house. Hmm. They labor in vain that build it. Uh, when, uh, when the pilgrims and the Puritans came to this country, they came for, yes, a better life. They came as missionaries, hmm. <laughs> a lot of people don't know. But they, but they came with the hope that a new nation could arise and where did they go first to find out how they should actually do it? Exactly the verses we're looking at today. And these ten principles, and along came the guys like William Penn then, who really went into depth, and then you had the, the great past, the, the, the preachers of the First Great Awakening, and began to preach the biblical principles, and it laid it all out. The point, Isaac, is that if the Lord doesn't build the house, you labor in vain to build it. And, and, and as you just said, I mean, I used to build houses. I built my own house. Uh, I know very well, you cannot put on a roof before <laughs> you lay the foundation. <laughs> Don't try to put a window in there before you've got the walls. Um, it'll be a mess and it won't stand. But these principles we're laying down here that starts with, who is God? Do I fear God? Do I reject God? and then the choice to pursue the truth and fear God. And then once we're on that track, then it allows us to then go logically step by step by step, and it opens up the pages of Scripture. And when it does, you see God has given us a blueprint for a nation. That's right. 
a blueprint mm. for our family. Nothing can be left out. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've enjoyed this now, this conclusion of our seventh principle, the role of justice in, in, in government and authority, and understand that you are uh, an executor of justice yourself, no matter your position. And, uh, and certainly, God gives us all the plan if we just choose to follow it. Well, thanks for watching us today. And uh, next week now, we're going to continue uh, in this series with uh, principle number eight. And we're going to talk about uh, citizens' duties. Uh, citizens' duties. Duties is a word a lot of people don't understand. We'll talk about it next week. Join with us in prayer. Partner with us prayer and financing, however God moves you.